end of the spectrum of sizes of junior programs uh, in the country. But, uh, but I came from a very small sailing association in Southern Maryland, SMSA, and I grew up in that sort of uh, very, well, we invented a junior program when I was about 13. So uh, it's definitely very different than uh, what a lot of the kids that I get to work with uh, get to experience. So I, I do feel like I've got um, some appreciation of the, of the range where folks might be coming from. Uh, just to get a little sense for the audience demographics, uh, how many folks are here as a uh, as a staff member, as a junior director or coach or some sort of staff member for this? Uh, kind of half, it looks like. So is it true that the other half are maybe a volunteer members here helping to support their program? Something like that. Great. Okay. And then the million dollar question maybe is uh, how many folks are working on staffing this coming summer? Anybody, anybody done with that process? <laughs> mostly. Okay, mostly. Good, you're well along. If you're totally done, you should go with some of the other stuff. <laughs> we can only scare you about your decisions at this point. <laughs> um, let's let's uh, move right on. Uh, besides, uh, besides my work, I do sales nights also, and I've got three kids, uh, eight and five and a half year old twins. So I uh, don't know if they're going to be fully involved yet or not, but with any of them, right? So, as some of you guys may have already uh, learned, staffing in the sailing world I found to be uh, more challenging than I think it is in many other industries. Uh, we deal with um, Seasonal hiring in many places, certainly places where it gets cold, but even here in San Diego, you know, I need to have a staff of approximately 15 instructors at the height of the summer. The rest of the year, um, I may only need uh, four or five at a time, but that's happening most weekends, and of course everybody has their own schedule constraints, so it does take a list of about 20 people in sort of a catering style. Uh, to, to make sure that I'm going to be able to come up with those five people on any given weekend. And that's tricky business, running, you know, running any kind of scheduling like that is tricky. Some folks want more hours, some folks want less, uh, and there's quite a bit of rollover also. So that's already daunting enough, um, hiring <coughs> lots of new people each summer, sort of reinventing the wheel, which is, that's a theme throughout Yacht Clubs, I think, right? A lot of committees sort of reset annually resetting that annual staff um, adds a, a trick to it. Uh, and it's not like you're just hiring these folks to do anything, right? The, uh, I, I can barely think of another job where you're taking uh, a staff person, quite possibly a young person without a tremendous amount of work experience behind them, and you're going to put them in a position with a whole lot of responsibility and a whole lot of autonomy Quite likely you're going to see them in the morning, and then you're going to send them out for several hours working with your uh, uh, working with your customers, whether they be kids or even adults. But they're going to handle most of that job uh, on their own, uh, out of your sight. Um, and of course, as we all know, uh, it's pretty daunting to think about. Uh, there certainly are some dangers involved, even real life and death dangers. So it is. Um, I know that it can be very stressful trying to put together that best team. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the traps that I've fallen in. and I don't know if I've fallen in them all, but I've, I've definitely fallen in a few at this point. And, uh, and also some of the success stories we've had along the way. Here we go. I think it starts with, uh, at the top of the list, deciding who we want and why. And I think that that's, uh, that's very important and it's married to the concept uh, of figuring out what your audience wants also. Right now I can tell you that uh, we're in the process of redesigning not all of our summer program because it's, it's been fairly uh, successful and consistent for 25 years or so. Um, but we do find that we need to constantly update it to meet our changing demographics. You know, we have a particularly high number of young kids this year for whatever reason. We have a particularly high number of kids near the more advanced end. 
Um, San Diego Yacht Club happens to be a, not exclusively, but admittedly racing oriented program. But we don't only do racing, so we want to make sure that we have offerings for our, uh, for our young sailors who might not be interested in going down that racing path. But all of those questions certainly dictate the kind of staff that you may want to have on board uh, or the kind of staff that, you know, that could get your job done. So it's a good thing we're all starting this early, right? Because if you're going to open up marketing or open up uh, registration for that summer program, say, in March, as you probably should, something like that, we need to, uh, and if those questions precede who we hire, it's time to get busy with that stuff. I think one thing you're going to find that I uh, return to several times in the next few minutes is I'm going to recommend that you, you gather your staff um, a little bit uh, from all of the above, if you will. We're going to go through some different areas, and I, and I think that there are advantages to using uh, some folks from each of those areas. So let's look at the first uh, decision, staff or volunteers. Um, most programs, I think, you know, have, have potentially experimented with both, um, and there are pros and cons. In my experience, I've gotten, um, luckily we have, we have a budget that allows us to go pretty heavily down the paid staff route, um, but I found that I've been guilty of ignoring some of the folks who would like to volunteer, and they're there. They're definitely there. And what a shame to not utilize that, uh, that motivation and talent that may be at your club. <clears throat> so definitely do think about whether you have volunteers, both uh, uh, adult volunteers who uh, may want to actually help with the coaching, uh, but more likely probably want to help with some of the many logistical issues that surround the program. <clears throat> could be registration. Could be just taking pictures and help getting pictures to the website or writing articles for your publication. Um, could just be helping uh, collect votes and de-rigging at the end of the day. It's really whatever they want, right? But I do think it's worth your time to send uh, some communication out to your members <coughs> and find out how you may use those volunteers. Many will be parents, some might not be. A lot of folks love to run a race committee. There is great utility. In, uh, in those volunteers, and you can save a lot of money that way, right? That can help you uh, free up some budgetary money, which I know is a concern for everybody, so that you can maybe devote that towards staffing in a different way. Similarly, uh, and this is a big one for a lot of clubs, club members versus visiting folks. Um, depending on the size of your club, that may be an option, but uh, let's get a feel for that demographically. How many folks um, are at a club that hires, from, at least partially, from within? That is to say, you make coaches of uh, your members. So that's great. That's great. And uh, and folks also use uh, visiting coaches that may be from other locations or even countries. Got some of that as well. Great. I think that's really important. And, uh, and let's talk about some of the. Uh, trade-offs and benefits. Actually, I'm going to bring, a, try, I'll try to keep it quick, but two anecdotes uh, that I think <coughs> illustrate some of the opportunities and maybe pitfalls here too. Um, several years ago, I hired an international coach, and we'll keep the names and nationalities out of this so that we don't generalize. Um, but not only did I hire this, hire this fellow because he was, he was very persistent, he had a, a well-established <laughs> resume, and I did check a reference, of course it was a person who I had never met giving the reference, that's something we'll come back to. Um, but he had a good reference, and, uh, and he looked like he had the skill set, and he called back many times and was persistent, so I hired him. And I didn't just hire him as a coach, um, we hired him for as a 420 race coach, so a pretty specific assignment uh, foreshadowing that uh, it wasn't something I could just easily mix and match with other staff members once the summer started. I was also really excited because this fellow told me that he didn't need um, guest housing. He didn't need to be hosted because he and his friends already had an apartment in San Diego for the summer. And I, I learned along through the years that that can be pretty tough getting that host housing. Sometimes that creates a little stress. So it's great. This guy already has his own housing. Right? A little red flag that should have gone up, right? Yeah. Long story short, the fellow arrived. And he was everything I thought he'd be for the first couple days. We usually do a couple days of training before the summer. Great powerboat operator. 
You know, we, we did a little capsize drill. He was really good at jockeying a 17-foot whaler close to the action, but not so close that I felt it was unsafe. He really looked like he had his act together. First day of the summer program started, it was great. Kids were psyched. Second day, where is he? All right, 9 o'clock, where is he? And as you guys know, something I really harp on my instructors is, you know, it, it might admittedly be a fun job, but there's a ton of responsibility. We're all looking really stupid if you don't make it on time and make it for your obligation. Parents are wondering what's going on. Also, finally the guy calls me two hours into the workday. He's crying. His brother at home has had a terrible car accident. He needs to, he needs to go home. I'm blown away. You know, I, I was mad a second ago, but now, well, geez, okay. Um, gosh, I'm sorry. Good luck. Then go do whatever you need to do and let us know how we can help. And hopefully we'll see in a few weeks. Hopefully he's fine. I don't know. So, that happened. Later that day, I looked in his, uh, his you know, locker and all his stuff was there. So that kind of backed up his story. I'm like, you just bail out. He's left all this nice gear. Anyway, we adapted. It wasn't pretty, but we adapted. I found a different coach who could cover that. Near the end of the summer, my instructors come in one morning and say, hey, we were at a party last night. He was there. He's been here all summer, touring California. All he needed from you was the visa to get in the US. So that was really disappointing. And we'll talk about how we might prevent that in a second. But that was clearly um, left me feeling particularly wary about visiting coaches. Now another guy. Another guy was hired uh, from coming out of a small program on the East Coast. And um, he was sailing in college, but uh, certainly wasn't in the elite ranks uh, at a top sailing school or an All-American or anything like that. And this fellow came out. And he had a good summer and it seemed to go okay. So he even went there, finished up college, came back and worked for the second summer. And, uh, and that was really great too. And by that time, he was totally enamored with San Diego, so he actually stayed in town. And he went and worked at J World for a whole bunch of years and really honed his uh, instructional skills working with adults, which I think is a, a different skill set, a little tougher audience, really makes you put your lesson plans together. And uh, 10, 15 years went by, and, uh, and long story short, he ended up coming back and being the junior director. Well, that, that's me, and uh, I think it's been pretty successful for both parties involved. So that kind of leaves me torn, right? I don't know, you know, if you just shun all the visiting instructor idea, you're giving up on that potential to bring in some fresh blood from, from wherever it may be. On the other hand, if you do choose to hire a lot of visiting instructors, you got to be aware of some of those uh, pitfalls. And we'll talk more about that. Thanks for indulging me in that episode. Um, but there are pros and cons, and I really think you should use both. As the junior director uh, at San Diego, I've gotten very involved with um, turning our best, and I don't mean best sailors, but our um, let's say, shall I say, our most motivated older juniors into coaches. I really love it. I think, um, I kind of view it as our last class. You know, this isn't about sailing necessarily. You're going to pick up a bunch of sailing, I'm sure, but this is really about turning them into successful citizens, hopefully, and uh, more active future members of the club. And uh, it's really just been great. An irony is when I started uh, back in 90, when I did one of those first summers I told you about, the club had a policy where they specifically would not hire members. A lot of clubs, I think, used to have that. Anybody still working with a club that has that policy? Okay. It's there, and there are some concerns we'll talk about. But boy, for a big club like San Diego, anyway, what a huge sacrifice that was. They were sending all this talent over. I mean, all the local clubs loved it because they were getting three and four great summer instructors every year just fed right to them by one of their neighbors. Meanwhile, San Diego Yacht Club was looking all over the world trying to get reliable folks. So they abandoned that policy somewhere along the line. Um, I really think 
that uh, if you have any kids in your program at all who are uh, middle to older age teenagers, you should think hard about uh, trying to turn them at least in part into some of your coaching staff. What's the big concern about using members? Uh, well, I was never really sure, but I think one of the concerns was, let's um, over the slide here. There we go. I think one of the concerns is that there'll be a feeling of entitlement, right? And they may be hard to control. It might be a conflict of interest because they'll feel like they can do whatever they want at the club they grew up in. I haven't found that really to be the case at all. Uh, certainly not any more so than somebody who might be visiting from 3,000 miles away for a two-month gig. Uh, what I have found is kind of just the opposite. The kids that you might hire from within your own club are surrounded by the grown-ups that they grew up around, their parents are in town. Um, I found that, that that really helps them put their best foot forward uh, more so than causes a, a lot of problems. Back, make sure I can skip anything here. Plus all the benefits, right? They know all about where everything is at your club. They know where the boat parts live. They know that that dock over there is a little rickety and you have to be careful if the kids go over there or we should fix it or whatever the case may be. Um, there's a whole lot of training. They know the waters, my goodness, right? Um, if you hire visiting instructors, you really need to take some time to have them learn where any shoals, hazards, rocks, trees, all the many things that your kids already know about that venue. And we already talked about it being the most advanced class. Um, kind of a related topic to that, um, particularly on the staff side. Uh, how many folks have been approached by parents that are, are really wanting that high-powered rock star coach, right? We really want you to have an all-American. I mean, we, we got to have a hot racer here, right? If our kids are going to progress, we got to have some hot racers as coaches. Maybe, maybe, um, but um, has anyone else shared the experience that those folks may not necessarily be the best instructor you've ever seen? They could be, right? It's not mutually exclusive, but there's certainly no guarantee. Just because this fellow just won the A division in the college nationals it is absolutely no indication that they're going to be a good instructor at all. And actually, I think probably a lot of you have also learned that uh, or seen that some of the folks who are kind of in that uh, not in the top tier of racing uh, are especially motivated to find their niche within the sport. And uh, I've had so many good experiences with smart young people who aren't fabulous racers but want to be involved, are great with the young kids, and it turns out, well, they, they, you know, they know PowerPoint. They're great at Excel. They can help you with registration. They want to learn the scoring program for when you run regattas. They just have all these skill sets and are much more motivated, frankly, than um, you know, when you hire that top racer. A lot of times, I think the whole relationship starts off a little off balance. You know, they've been approached like they've, they've been romanced for their sailing record. It's pretty easy to, to get to feeling a little uh, uh, entitled, I think, before the whole thing gets started. So how do you find, if you are going to uh, find some visiting coaches, um, where can you find them? I'll go back to this one side. Well, we try to have a number of ways. Um, and I, I definitely would open this up to the group too, because I may not have the right answer. Uh, I think Sail One Design and other web sources like uh, Scuttlebutt and Sailing Anarchy and the U.S. Sailing Job Bank too, of course, uh, are all good sources. And uh, we've done pretty well uh, with those. Um, but we've gone also a little more um, <clears throat> actively, I feel, in the last couple of years. Uh, this uh, last year we had a reason why our head coach was on the East Coast anyway. And uh, we had him go and visit uh, five or six different schools in New England when he was nearby and talk to those college, co college coaches and actually attend the college practice. And we did make several uh, good connections through that. So if you 
uh, I guess my point would be if you have a sailing university nearby, uh, that's certainly a great source. We actually don't have so much uh, college sailing in San Diego. It's a real challenge for us. UCSD is here, but frankly, that's about it right now. And we wish there were a couple more college teams because they certainly are a great source there. Um, another one I think is through, um, if you are a racer, one design classes you may be involved with. So I, you know, I'm involved with the snipe, which is kind of neat because there really isn't a whole lot of sniping in junior sailing. I think there's a little bit, but not much. Um, so what that means is I'm kind of getting exposed when I sail snipes to a different group of sailors than I may see in the normal junior national travels. And again, I think it's kind of leveraging those parents and grown-ups that you already know. If I bring out somebody for a cross-country summer who's part of my snipe experience, I'm feeling they're going to act all right because we know everybody involved. You know, sailing is a small world, and uh, it helps you feel better about those, uh, those references. So now it's time to start hiring. This is exactly what I'm doing right now, and I, I gather many of you guys are too. Every year we say we're going to have this done by Christmas. It's never happened. Never happened. It's a good goal, um, but I find it's tough. And I think it's tough uh, uh, for both parties involved. I don't think the club's really ready to pull the triggers, and not too many of the um, uh, college-age sailors are necessarily either. Seems like these days, if you haven't noticed, we're, we're competing with uh, uh, internships a lot more than I think we used to. I'm getting the feeling that uh, young people in college now understand that a degree isn't probably going to be enough just right there on its own, so they also want to come out of graduation with an internship, and that is limiting them to maybe one or two summers of sailing coach employment where many people used to just do that throughout college. I actually stumbled into this uh, just about uh, two months ago, and it's been really useful for me this spring. The number one thing I ask folks over an interview, which is often a phone interview, right? I say, okay, the first night of the summer program, we, we do a thing called Family Night, where we have all the parents and kids there together at the pool, and, and we introduce the staff. And so I just asked the potential candidate, what are we going to say at that introduction? Uh, where do you go to school, of course, those sorts of things. But uh, what's your racing experience, if that's relevant? More importantly, what is your coaching experience and interest? doesn't even have to be in sailing, right? If you've been a soccer coach for eight years, that's going to be really good experience, I bet. Or if you've been an instructor of any kind, that's probably good stuff. But by having that uh, candidate explain to me the things, the bullet points, basically, that I would say about them at that first night's introduction, I get a really uh, strong sense for how they might fit in my team. And uh, that's been very helpful for me. We talked about references. I got a reference for that fellow who was with me that one great first day of the summer program. But apparently not a good enough reference. And uh, I bet I bet most of you have seen this in, uh, in other hiring decisions you may have been involved with. Somebody getting a bad reference or a, a, an unfavorable reference, that's pretty rare, right? I mean, you've got to really get on somebody's bad side for them to, um, for them to want to bash you to a stranger. So I guess what I've learned is I probably need to know the person giving me the reference hopefully, if I'm going to get a really useful answer. And uh, so I try to track that down. And again, that's a reason why you might favor uh, a candidate who's coming from a class that you're involved with, a sailing class that is, uh, uh, or any possibility of knowing the reference, I think, is really huge. And uh, one of the phrases I really look for um, is, hopefully you've heard it before too, is that where they say, well, I wish they were going to work for me for another summer, but they've been great, so I wish them well on their new adventure. You know, that's a real glowing endorsement. If the, if the person would still have a, a job opportunity at the place they work last, I think that's what we're really after. 
but definitely check references. If you were hiring somebody from elsewhere, I think uh, it's an absolute must, and I would work hard to try to make those references be somebody you know. Compensation concepts. Boy, this is all over the park. Um, I can tell you that, uh, well, I'll just throw it out there. Um, we pay most of our instructors uh, between $10 and $20 an hour, which I think is relatively representative of the market. Um, not particularly high. I think there are other places that pay higher. Uh, we have good surf nearby. That seems to help attract <laughs> people to this location. Uh, yes, thank you. John, do you pay overtime on top of that? So that's a great question. Um, and I need to find someone in my organization who's a little bit more of an HR expert. I think that might be true at a lot of clubs, that there isn't necessarily a true HR expert at the club. But, um, well, my understanding is this. I pay my employees hourly, uh, and I think that that might actually be the only legal way to do it without, uh, I believe if you wanted to pay them on a, a temporary salary, I guess if you would call it that. That's actually how I was paid 20 years ago when I first worked for SDYC. You were, uh, you were signed up for the summer at a flat rate, and that was that. I don't think that's actually legal these days, uh, unless the person was a contractor, at which point I think they have to have their own insurance. And I don't want to speak to that too much because, again, I'm not an expert, but I, the advice that I've been given at my club um, in the last seven or eight years is that it needs to be out. Uh, which is not great news because it is a crazy job, and without some special scheduling efforts, there is going to be overtime. Uh, we finally stopped shooting ourselves in the foot. We originally had a schedule that called for meeting at 8. Uh, Boy, love the details. It went from 8 to noon, and then there was a lunch break, and then it went from 1 to 5. Well, that is 8 hours. And that means that every single minute that they punch in before 8, which I want them to do, right, because we started it, and every single minute that they're after noon, and every single minute before 1 p.m. and every minute after 5 that's all overtime. And with 15 instructors, I was finding, oh look, I've got two and a half hours of overtime every single day. And that's even before we get to one of those weekend regattas that happens after Monday through Friday of all week sailing. And then all of a sudden that whole weekend is overtime, right? So it's very tricky. Um, I don't know if everyone wants to go down this road. The way I've handled that the last several years has also been tricky. I've hired quite a few more instructors and had them work not necessarily a steady schedule. And work. It basically, it's a constant game to avoid the overtime. And that doesn't really put your best foot forward for instructor continuity either. Right? I mean, my first choice would certainly be to have that motivated 21-year-old work with the kids Monday through Friday then take them to the regatta that weekend if that's what we've been training for. And, and yeah, then we'll try to find a day off, but you'll get through it. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's a very expensive way to do it. So we've gone to a larger staff model with a more volatile schedule, which is tricky. It also costs more in uniforms. Um, talk to your HR person if you're lucky enough to have one. Um, but I, I'm not sure. What's your experience with that, Peggy? How, are you hiring folks? Uh, I think we get just slammed Tricks on this, or know about uh, basically hiring on salary. I think would be the. Yeah, you're, you're, you're uh, in the state of California at least. You're, you're not allowed to hire instructors uh, for salary. If there are line employees that fit a very narrow category, um, like professionals, um, lawyers, doctors, etc., who you can pay salary to, even though they don't manage. But the definition of a salary employee in California is a manager. They need to be managing people. But if you're a line employee delivering the service. 
um, you have to be paid overtime. You have to pay them a daily rate, but it's based on an hourly rate. And if they work over eight hours, then they get that prorated percentage extra, which is time and a half for eight to 12 hours and double time for 12 plus. So it kind of sounds like, unfortunately, the, the bad news, I guess, for, for those of us trying to staff sailing firms is sailing doesn't fit the model as nicely, does it? I, I've had uh, some of the HR folks in the non-sailing divisions of, of the Yacht Club tell me before they've reminded me, you know, these folks need to take breaks, you know, they need to take a break every couple hours. And I say, yeah, but, but my employee is actually not even here today. He's working in Newport Beach where he's out on the water for eight hours in a power boat. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, okay. Well, we're doing it. <laughs> I guess we'll figure it out. Uh, we ran into the same things as commercial operations with adults and kids, but we, uh, I think we do a really good job of making our instructors really happy and being honest with them about where we're playing fast and loose with the law. For instance, um, the mandatory 15 minute break for any hourly employee um, every four hours um, and say, um, Here's what we're providing for you um, that's a little bit better than digging ditches, and here's how we're going to make it fun for you, and where we need your flexibility is in these particular areas. And, um, and you know, we've been at it for 30 some odd years, and a very happy staff, and not a single instructor in 33 years has said, hey, where's my 15 minute break? Exactly. So, so if you set up a mercenary experience in your club, then you will get mercenary behavior from your employees. But if you set it up as a family and you treat them really well and give them the benefit of the doubt, it makes a huge difference in dealing with those unsolvable problems because right. they are, for our industry, unsolvable. Exactly. And I completely agree. Like I said, the, uh, the folks that have brought up that break, luckily, because I think they are happy, it's never been the staff themselves. I'm not even sure they don't, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's been the folks. Jess. Uh, Jess Gary, Long Beach Yacht Club, yeah. um, California. <laughs> Uh, California is very interesting with, with their workers and their breaks, so it's kind of a different monster. And I don't want to talk too much out of turn when I'm not super thorough, like John said, about all the HR strictness of it all. But I found a way to use the weekly summer program, program instructor as an hourly employee. And then on the weekends or after hours on like a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night race, more of a bonus structure, more of a flat rate. Um, it can be categorized as a bonus, or you can name it whatever you want, but it doesn't come out of the hourly pay, because anybody who's a program director, it's eight weeks of chaos in the summer. You need staff every day, all day, all the time, and some days you need them to stay late or come early. So there's, I've had success with talking with our HR gal at two different yacht clubs I've worked at and setting that up. So it's something to experiment if you're having trouble with overtime. Um, think about using it as a bonus, whether it's a bonus at the end of the summer, that they don't see for a while. Most of the people want to get paid because they're young kids, or it's a you know your your bi-monthly bonus on the paycheck. But I guess another takeaway uh, related to what we're talking about is whatever way you come uh, to an agreement upon the rate you set, if it's an hourly rate, make sure you're ready to pay some overtime at that rate because it's probably going to happen. So uh, if the person successfully negotiates at the absolute top end of where you were willing to go, there's probably more. <laughs> um, let's see. And then getting all the details right. Another, um, another area that can be daunting, I know, uh, with HR and all of you, if you, especially if you are using visiting coaches, is uh, they may not be there seven, eight, nine days before your program starts. They may be arriving, you know, sort of moments before you want to begin that work. Hopefully you have a little bit of a training period. Uh, but my point is, um, most post places really need all that paperwork to be done before the person starts. There may be a drug test involved. There may be uh, uh, citizenship paperwork to file, etc. And I know I'm guilty of it several times that timing just hasn't quite worked out and the person has begun working before we've gotten a couple of those papers uh, filled out. Uh, <coughs> I've on some wood, that, that one hasn't really bitten me yet, but it is something I'm aware of. And 
I think it's very important to try, if you have visiting instructors, a lot of the paperwork can be done by mail or electronically. Do whatever you can to get ahead of that and make sure that, uh, that everybody involved has the protection that they really should uh, once the actual work begins. Well, um, so how do we keep these folks if we want to? Some of them we don't. Maybe I should have titled this retaining versus not retaining. <laughs> not, not that you want to get rid of them. It's just a, it's a <coughs> seasonal reality that uh, we're probably going to have to purge some um, and, and at other times bring folks on. So um, that is a challenge. I'm not sure I have brilliant ideas for that. But, uh, one of the ways that I think um, has been the, the most helpful in keeping our staff happy and, and effective and finding out who the ones we most want are is giving them um, uh, some autonomy and responsibility. I'm not going to speak too much to this because Larry's got some great things to say about this aspect of it. But I think that the folks that uh, you really want to keep on board are the folks that can use some creativity that you grant them uh, the privilege of using so they can start to make the program their own. Stability versus freshness. Um, kind of a similar uh, idea that we were just talking about in the summer, how you know, for continuity's sake, it sure is tempting to try to work uh, that person into the ground is what ends up happening because you'd love to have them train the kids and then you'd love to have them send go to the weekend or God because that only makes sense, but then it's another week on Monday and it just goes on and on. And a lot of the folks are young and they probably can handle it, um, but it is easy to get stale and burnt out. Uh, so I think that as a program director, you've got to be constantly making that abstract decision between uh, continuity and freshness. And that's a little bit of a game. You probably have to measure that out person by person. Continuing education is, I think, useful as well. Um, most programs these days, since uh, at least since 08 or so, have had pretty real budget concerns, right? Um, I can tell you when I first started in 07 uh, as the junior director, I'll be honest, we didn't talk about the budget that much. It didn't seem to be that big of a deal. And then uh, when the market changed uh, the last many years, you know, it's kind of all about the budget now. Um, so, sailing instructors probably have a little bit of a ceiling on their, uh, on their actual uh, salary. But there's other stuff we can do <coughs> to uh, help sweeten the situation a little bit in that respect. One is giving them some entitlement to help design and steer the program. Another, I think, is sending them for continued U.S. sailing classes at the top of the list, right? Getting your successful level one instructors up through level two and level three, or maybe sending them to a keelboat training class is a way for them, uh, which you can pay for. Uh, a common arrangement is to have them pay for it, but you uh, pay them back when they've successfully passed the class. That's another way to handle it. But I think that showing your employees that, uh, that willingness to invest back into them helps quite a bit. If there are boats that the club has that uh, the instructor would feel privileged to get to use some keel boats perhaps or something, that's another way you might be able to sweeten the pot up a little bit. And then here's what I think another big one. Keep them sailing, all right? It's very easy to have your coaches start doing so much coaching that, well, you know, I'd kind of like to do this big sniper guy this weekend. No, sorry, it's, it's you know, it's the JOs. We need to send you to coach the 420s. And next thing you know, nine months, a year has gone by, and that coach hasn't done a regatta. I apologize for continuing to put a racing spin on this, but that, that is most of my world. Um, we need those coaches to be relevant, actual competitors in the real world, right? And um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't race nearly as much as uh, I'd like to. But what is true is every time I come back from a regatta, I'm a much better coach for about three weeks. Just you know, I just you have those anecdotes at the top of your head. You, you're just refreshed on the whole sport. You love it again. 
It's all great. You remember that thing that happened. You're interested in that rule that came up. Um, I just think you're a much better coach if you're if you're actually playing the game. And it's very easy for lots of good coaches to do so much work that pretty soon nobody remembers when they last competed, and then you run the risk of becoming less relevant. So um, I try to put my foot down and, and practically insist that at least my racing-oriented coaches stay in the game and we find a way in the schedule to make sure that they can make those competitions. And I think the kids they work with really appreciate it. So that's only scratching the surface towards motivating. Luckily, we have somebody here with a much more experience on that <coughs> than I do. Um, any questions before I uh, step down on that? So now we've we've uh, talked a little bit about uh, how to locate, how to decide which coaches we want. Hopefully, how to locate them and how to get them in the door and officially hired. And now Larry's going to talk about the important aspects of uh, keeping them happy so they want to do a good job for us for a nice long time. wrap up the thing on motivation with again practical story and a great example. John and I met as a result of this and in our first phone conversation just as he talked about his program I knew we were going to uh, sync up because of you know my perspective about this motivating the stories he told about the people that he brings in. So we have 15 minutes. No, uh, yeah? Clock right? What are you going to learn about motivation in 15 minutes? How many of you have formal training? One, two. All right, so only two people will know that I'm really just making all this stuff up. <laughs> I want to give you a couple things. Um, some ideas, right, that, that may help your thinking about motivation, because my experience around this is we have lots of experience about being motivated or motivating other people. It's just we may not have the formal training to organize that experience and let us take advantage of it. So I want to give you a couple ideas about that. Some really old ideas. From a guy named Douglas McGregor. I see really old. He was writing a lot in the 50s and 60s in the business. And then some sort of what's the current hot stuff around motivation and you know, what do we think is going on. And I think you can apply it both to certainly to volunteers and, and to paid staff. So um, here's three names. Again, you will get these slides. You can tell how data gents they've been, right? Uh, but you'll get these names. So I'll, I'll talk about each one, one long enough so you can probably write them down. Douglas McGregor did a lot of writing. Again, he's the, he's the old guy. And pretty much was just ahead of his time. So all the stuff he's writing about this 50s and 60s and into the 70s, I think he lived that long, um, was ignored pretty much back then by corporate America and by organizations. And now when you look at what's going on around leadership and motivation and those kinds of things, almost all the ideas that we're using these days are his. So he really thought about what's the relationship between the organization and the individual and was pretty much in favor of taking care of people and helping them grow, et cetera, et cetera. Daniel Pink, anybody here ever hear about him? Because he's much more modern. <coughs> okay, so he's got a couple things out. Um, the book on motivation is called Drive, the R-I-B-E, as in Drive Motivation. Um, if you are responsible in your organization for things like incentive programs and bonuses and all of that, if you really want to steer yourself, um, if you want to do it in a short period of time, Go on, uh, you can do it on YouTube and look up uh, RSA, Daniel Pink. It's a great little 17 minutes, I think it's a TED Talk. And essentially he's going to tell you that virtually everything we do in corporate America for motivating people and giving them incentives is counterproductive. Gives us people who are uh, not engaged in the process and probably won't be created for us. Uh, and then he'll talk about what things really do motivate people. And I'll share those with you. And then this guy, I, I've never heard his last name said out loud, so Sinek. I don't know. Sinek. Pardon? Sinek. 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 Yeah. Um, he's, just, he's making a, it looks like he's going to make a great living at a gazillion dollars by drawing three concentric circles and labeling the inside one why and the next one what. And some of you are nodding your heads, so you may have seen him again. Ted Talks. He's got a couple books out. I'm, I'm reading one of them now. Uh, 
But it, it, it's all consistent, and he talks about how to engage people. He's thinking about it a lot around sales and organizations, but then leadership as well. And it has to do with sort of what's inside of people. So that, that's the thread that I'm going to use. So we'll talk about these one at a time. Um, McGregor said, one of the things I love about what he said is that our ability to influence people We've got on the one side our organizational needs that we have to meet, right? We've got to get people to work on time. We have to have, have the right skill set. We have to have them treat our customers in the right way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a responsibility to do that. And on the other hand, we've got these individuals who have needs. And his point was the only place that we have influence over people is when those sets overlap. That is... The only reason somebody's going to do something we want them to do as an organization is because they think they get something out of it that's important to them. Now, it may be as fundamental as keep your job. I want my job, therefore I'm going to do what you tell me to do. But that's a pretty limited range, which means what? As soon as they can get a better job, they're gone, da, 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 da. So, it's a, so just thinking about that it's, at its basic core level, what's it tell you about what our ability to influence or motivate people is? What's the secret to it? Match up the needs. Win-win. Yeah, right. I mean, I want to get a, you know, those Venn diagrams, right? I'd like to get those to be a bigger overlapping set. The more I can connect for somebody, what I'm asking them to do as part of their job with something they want to do in their lives that's important to them, the more influence I have over them. It's sort of that simple. The stuff's not complicated when you get down to it. It's just hard. Right? I mean, we don't need to make it any more complicated than it is. It's just hard to do it in the midst of running organizations and limited budgets and blah, 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 blah. But that was one of McGregor's uh, primary points. And I think it's a good thing to think of. Now, that also tells me that I would like to know a lot about my individuals. So we'll talk about that in a minute as a tools on how to do that. So Daniel Pink and his work on drive and motivation says there's three things that people are looking for, three sort of big categories. One of them is a sense of mastery. We want, as human beings, to be getting better at something that's important to us, actually. We want to get better. We want to do a better job. We want to learn new things. So mastery is one of them. Autonomy. We want to have some control over what we get to do. If you're in a situation where every single little thing is dictated to you exactly how to do it, you got no control, you're not very motivated. So we want to have some sense of autonomy. <coughs> and we want to belong to something bigger than ourselves. Bigger than the task. So if it's only about this little task and I don't connect it to some bigger picture, it's less motivating. The more we can get those three, three things lined up. Some sense of I'm getting better at something that's important to me. Some sense of I have some autonomy and some control, some say so over what I'm being asked to do and probably how I'm being asked to do it. And then it's connected to something bigger than me. To the degree we can work those three things, we've increased and strengthened that overlap and the influence we have over someone. So let's get really complicated. This uh, five, I think it's five, I don't know, we'll have to see once we get it. <laughs> Things are, that, like when I'm working in corporate programs and we're getting coaches to start a coaching, not like skill coaching, sailing coaching, but you know, skill development inside corporations. They say, you know, if you're not talking to your employee, the person you're going to coach, and asking, what's your vision? What's your picture of themselves? What do they want their life to be like? Where do they see themselves in three years or five years or whatever, right? That's all that connection to that purpose stuff. Who are you? What, what do you want to be doing? Um, if you know, if you have a picture of that, what are your objectives, right? How are you going to measure your progress towards that? You know, where do you need to be in a year? Where do you need to be in six months? Where do you need to be in three years? You know, and helping people think through that, but also learning that about people. What do you need to know, and what are the skills you have to have to get yourself there? What's your plan? Right? This all sort of evolves into, so you got a plan to get there? I mean, do you know where you're trying to go, and do you have a plan to get yourself there? And last, what are the values that you bring into that? What's important for you? Who are you as a human being? I'm dealing you know, with older people and asking things like, 
And what do you want your tombstone? What do you want your kids to say about you when you're gone? Right? Those start to reflect it. Who do you want to be as a human being? What are you about? And I tell you, if you don't know those things about the people you're trying to coach, and I think the people in your organization and the people you're trying to motivate, we're missing the chance to connect what I'm asking them to do to something bigger than do your job today, be on time, run the run the and, uh, run the syllabus or whatever it is. Make sense? So it's just it's conversations. It's like, do we really know these people, or are we just like treating them as you know cogs in the wheel? I have a friend. His name's Tiagi. It's actually much more He goes by Tiagi, and, and this is a phrase that I stole from him. In a, in a, it's another little tool, as simple as it is. It may be hard to see it from those angles. So it's a two by two uh, matrix. And if you ever use anything more complicated than a two by two matrix in terms of models, you're probably overcomplicating the world. Here's what this is. Things above here are things I have. Things down here are things I don't have. This is stuff I want. This is stuff I don't want. You can draw it on the back of an envelope and spend five minutes and start putting stuff down. And then look at it and say, well, what have I just told myself? You know, what did I put in there? Are there things? Are there relationships? Are there, is this concepts? Is this objects in the, in the world? Um, was it easy for me to fill out certain boxes and not other boxes? Uh, did I feel an obligation to have an even number of things? I mean, it's just a Rochard sort of test, but there's a little bit of organization to what's important to you. And I use this tool with groups, with impact work groups, with individuals, and it's a good way to start a conversation. Are we on the same page? Are we trying to get the same stuff? What should we be celebrating because we do a good job at it? <coughs> he said there's five ideas on my chart. I think that's what that five is. Um, <laughs> and, and then I'd say things that scare people, like so, for those of you that have a significant other, go home and do this exercise with your significant other and see what conversation that starts, right? Uh, do it on. Do it on the significant <coughs> other, you think their list might be if you exchange them if you're brave. And so, <laughs> it's just simple stuff, but it starts a conversation that says, do we know each other? Do we know enough about what's important to each other to get those two, you know, organizational needs, personal needs overlap? And then again, I can connect and say, here's how this works. Here's how we're moving forward. So two things I always think about. And then John's going to tell a quick story that I think ties all this together as a good example of what they do in their program. Ah, they're willing volunteers. And I don't use that word like volunteer. I'd say this to people who are paying their employees a lot of money. I want to think about them as willing volunteers. They're there because they want to be. What I've got to figure out is what are they getting out of it? How do I make them want to be there? Because so they can go get another job. And just really remember it. You're in there and they do it for their own reasons, not for ours. And I don't know why it's important to them. John's going to tell a quick story about um, what happens, what they do, that I think ties all this together. It's one of the stories that I thought, ooh, I don't like this guy. And then you're going to do some surveys and go away. Yeah. <laughs> so um, hopefully each June, yeah, we do this all year, but the June is when our big one. That's when we are assembling that, that group of people <coughs> to be hired for the summer. Some of them have been with us for a while, some are new. But it's time to start putting the final touches on our plan for the next eight weeks, right? And uh, this is where I think uh, we can really empower these people and, and uh, not only motivate them and have them have a better experience, but also get a better product for your kids, too. And that is and how you treat the syllabus versus the lesson plans. We're going to put on the difference, right? Syllabus is what we're going to teach. Lesson plans are how we're going to do that. Bottom line is, this is what I consider my responsibility that I go through with my junior committee. We decide what we want the junior program to teach in each class. But I don't dictate to those coaches how to do that. That would be a waste of their talent, and it probably wouldn't be very interesting for them either, too. So each year, we start over. And uh, they can reference old lesson plans if they want, but we go in a room for a few days before that summer program starts, and we turn this year's syllabus into this year's <coughs> lesson plans as penned by this year's staff. And uh, it's great, because you know every year it never fails. We get some new input, a new way to teach you know, hacking. Pick, pick your most mundane sounding sailing topic. Somebody smart has got a new way of looking at that, a new drill to help highlight that skill, 
uh, something that is more fun than just doing it the same way we did for the last 20 years. And uh, to me, it's really kind of been as simple as that, and getting them to uh, getting them to take part in how we as a team are going to deliver the message this summer. And uh, those things were very successful and ties into uh, keeping them motivated. Yeah, I think just a sense of autonomy and mastery. So uh, this does nothing other than concluding. That's the thank you. <laughs> and don't forget, slide surveys, give feedback to the organization. We have another 60 seconds. Any questions, any comment that you'd like to make? Anything's important.